Doglapan Chapter 5. Brofers, The Beginning of My Entrepreneur. Gurgaon, 2015. Anticipatory Bail. That was the name of the first ever file I created on my new Apple computer, on day one of joining Grofers as their CFO. Operating out of a small warehouse in Gurgaon with 15 odd people, Grofers had just about pivoted from being a B2B brand offering delivery services to merchants to a consumer facing brand delivering groceries and doing at best 30 orders a day. We had a good day yesterday, with a total of 30 orders, but ek punga ho gya, there has been a problem, I was informed by Albinder on the first day of my joining. Apparently, Grofers had onboarded an organic vegetable vendor. This guy, one Mr. Kapoor, ended up ordering vegetables worth 500 rupees from his own organic vegetable business listed on Grofers, to be delivered to his own house. It so happened that with 30 odd orders to fulfill on the day, the manager overlooked the fact that the order was for organic veggies and ended up sending veggies from a regular vendor and fulfilling the order. Kapoor was infuriated and saw it not as an instance of wrong delivery but as a case of fraud. So much so that he registered a case with the neighboring Greater Kailash Police Station. As luck would have it, Kapoor lived in the same compound as Arun Jaitley, the then finance minister. Since his address was the same as the minister's, the police station didn't waste any time in officially lodging his complaint. A case under section 420 of the Indian Penal Code was therefore registered against the two directors of Grofers, Albinder Singh Dinsa and his co-founder Saurabh Kumar, for alleged cheating. Albinder wanted me to take up this matter and help resolve it. My brother-in-law, Shonik, is a criminal defense lawyer, and hence, he was my go-to person in this case. He was quick to get Albinder and Saurabh anticipatory bail from the Saket court. While this was a relief, it technically only meant that the police would inform them seven days in advance of making any arrest. The issue still needed resolution. I tried to reason it out with Kapoor but soon realized that his angst ran deeper and that it wasn't just about being delivered the wrong veggies. His son had apparently set up a company called I Say Organic, and despite the fact that it had started much before Grofers, it had failed to garner investor interest. Now that he had to reconcile to being a vendor with Grofers, he didn't take to it very kindly. It was clear that he wouldn't let the matter go so easily. Since an fur had been filed, it could be quashed only by the High Court. Shonak put me in touch with a High Court lawyer who had a practice in Nidhi Bog, Delhi. A jolly, Punja lawyer, he assured me in his Punjabi accent that it was too minor a case and that he would have it quashed. To my queries, on whether he needed any other details, his reply was a relaxed, Grover Saab G, I will have it taken care of. But he was either ill-prepared or overconfident. On the allotted date, the High Court refused to quash the fur. For the first time in my career, I felt like I had let down someone who had placed his confidence in me. Albinder, however, quickly put me in touch with Giri Subramaniam, the son of Gopal Subramaniam. Subramaniam Sr., of course, besides being a lawyer of repute, has served as the Solicitor General of India. On Giri's advice, we assigned the case to another senior lawyer, one Mr. Seti. The strategy was that we would put up the case once again before the High Court, for it to be rejected. That rejection, in turn, would pave the way for us to move to the Supreme Court. As planned, the case for quashing the fur was put up for hearing one more time and was rejected yet another time, enabling us to knock on the door of the Supreme Court. At this stage, I requested Geary if we could ask his father to represent us in the Supreme Court. Back in the day, Senior lawyers of his standing charged as much as 7.5 lakh rupees per hearing. It was a huge amount to pay, but we simply couldn't afford to take any risks. I recall my meeting with the distinguished lawyer Gopal Subramanian vividly. After I had explained the case to him, his response was 15 minutes of hysterical laughter. He found it hard to believe that a case of this nature was being taken to the Supreme Court. One question that he did ask me, once he'd stopped laughing at the absurdity of the case, was the name of the judge in whose court the hearing was slated to take place. When I replied that it would be Jagdish Singh Kar, who later went on to become the 44th Chief Justice of India, he did caution me that the case could go either way. On the appointed date, we were at the highest court of the land for a case that involved vegetables worth 500 rupees and had seen multiple high court hearings. Our case was listed at number 14. 14 is my birth date and my lucky number, and I really hope to God that it would prove to turn lucky that day. To be honest, though, it didn't seem like a possibility, especially as the first 13 cases listed ahead of us met with a firm dismissal in all of two minutes. After every case number was called out, there were two distinct sounds that I heard, Janab, by way of attempted explanation from the defendant's lawyer, 
followed by a thud made by the case file having been dropped by the judge, indicative of the case's dismissal. Clearly, this 500 rupees case had become an albatross around my neck. The call for case number 14, however, wasn't followed by the customary Janab. Instead, Gopal Subramaniam opened with an assertion that caught the attention of the judge, this is the most interesting case of my career, he stated with a flourish. He followed this up with an analogy. Sir, a street side vendor sold you a mango, claiming that it was sweet. You ate the mango and didn't find it sweet. Will our judicial system allow itself to be clogged by such cases? He quickly went on to explain that if the gentleman under question was claiming that he was defrauded, we had to be able to see the property under question to determine if it was indeed a case of fraud. Essentially, he used a technical argument to draw attention to the fact that the police hadn't preserved the property, the vegetables in this case. Importantly, he was clear that at the level of the Supreme Court, the verdict had to be based on the interpretation of the law and not just on the merit of the case. He was right. To the fact that there was no property, which could prove whether the vegetables were organic and therefore whether defrauding had indeed happened, the judge noted his agreement. The fur was summarily quashed and the case dismissed. It is another matter that we had to spend 18 long months fighting a 500 rupees case while also spending over 25 lakh rupees to resolve it. Interestingly, in this intervening period of 18 months, every single fundraising meeting that I set up had to begin with an explanation of this curious case, US 420, Char Sao Bizi, on the Grofers founders. The responsibility at Grofers was divided in a manner that product and tech were handled by Albinder, operations were overseen by Saurabh, while everything that was commercial, regulatory and financial was under my purview. While I was designated as the CFO, I had stepped into the shoes of the third co-founder from day one of my joining. Besides handling the odd case of Mr. Kapoor and the veggies, the first nine months at Grofers went by in a flurry of activity for me. On the one hand we were expanding to a new city every week, while on the other there were a series of fundraising rounds. While the series around had seen participation from Tiger and Sequoia, with $5 million each at a valuation of $35 million, the Series B financing round saw Tiger, Sequoia as well as the DST Group, participating through another investing entity called Apoletto. I thereafter initiated the Series C round, in which we saw not just these investors but also SoftBank joining hands for a total funding of $120 million. Albi and I were a strong team. When it came to going to the US for fundraising, Albi preferred to do it himself, but once the term sheets were signed, I would solely take over till the money hit our account. The year 2015 was truly the year of Grofers, as we went from a valuation of $35 million to $370 million in a matter of 9 months. Our biggest competitor at the time was Big Basket. However, so deft were Albi and I as a team in terms of fundraising that we caught them unawares. This, despite the fact that Big Basket had a business that was twice as big as ours. They also had better sourcing capabilities than us and hence had better margins. However, they were old school, and their tech particularly was poorer. Come to think of it, Grofers and Big Basket had complementary skills. If they knew retail well, we were great at tech and digital marketing. If they were smart in warehousing, we were great at last mile delivery. If they were big in South India, we were big in the North. It was a typical Zomato Swiggy story, only in this case, while we were raising funds in quick succession, Big Basket wasn't able to do it. Between the Series A and Series B rounds, Albinder also wanted me to flip the company to a new jurisdiction, in this case, to Singapore. There were several reasons for this, and contrary to popular perception, tax saving wasn't one of them. The first was that if the company was based out of India, investors were loath to sit on the board of directors for fear of being dragged into such 500 rupees cases, as in India there is no difference in law between an executive director and other directors in terms of culpability. Anyone filing any case against the company simply had to pick up the names of the directors of the company from the registrar of companies. There was also more flexibility in Singapore when it came to structuring the shareholding agreement in terms of preference shares and debentures as opposed to simple equity. Besides, with the risk of frequent unpredictable changes in FDI restrictions in multi-brand retail in India, Flipkart had been externalized to Singapore in 2011. Albi felt that if there was, at a later date, any possibility of a merger with them, it could be done with fewer complications if Grofers was also externalized. Through mutual contacts, I was led to a tax expert, Harshal Kamdar, who worked at PwC at the time. An extremely sorted guy when it came to taxation and structuring, he had done a couple of these externalizations. With his inputs, we created a company in Singapore with a mirror shareholding structure as the Indian entity. 
All shareholders then subscribe to Grofer's International Private Limited shares at nominal value. The one challenge that I had was to do with the shares of Dipinder Goyal of Zomato, who had invested 60 lakh rupees in Grofer's. While the rest of the shareholders had earned money outside India, and had foreign accounts and could transfer funds from their foreign accounts, the same wasn't true of Goyal. The challenge, therefore, lay in the allocation of shares to him. Until we got Albinder's relative who was a US resident to subscribe to the shares and then make a gift deed to Dipinder. The Singapore entity thus created was Chris and Grofers International Private Limited, while Grofers India was now its subsidiary. It was a complicated transition, especially as we had to endorse thousands of agreements that had been entered into with small shopkeepers. I completed the entire process in under two months. Naivety. Is Albinder's heart in the right place? I was taken aback to hear Maduri raise this question to me. This was at a time when, post the Series D funding round, Albinder and Saurabh did secondary sales of their shares that offered them liquidity. Both he and Saurabh bought Range Rovers, in fact, Maduri's family got them a sweet deal from Carnal. The original team that had been in place before my joining was also given BMWs in recognition of their efforts. For the first time, I had stopped in my tracks to see that despite all the heavy lifting that I had done, I was yet to see any monetary gains for myself. My shares, of course, hadn't vested by then, so there was no opportunity to sell. I was, however, enjoying work too much to allow this setback to come in my way. Besides, I trusted the guy. Maduri, however, being her perceptive self, felt that Albinder had failed to acknowledge my role in the 10x growth that the company had achieved since my joining. Much later, I also realized that Albinder was getting new people to join in, who weren't even CXOs, at salaries in crores, while I continued to draw my original salary of 40 lakh rupees. It was only in June 2016 that I decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Albinder and asked him point-blank if there was a problem. Why are you saying this? When his reply. I reminded him that while I was the CFO of a company worth $350 million, my salary was as low as 40 lakh rupees. An apology followed, with an innocuous explanation that it had escaped his notice and that I should go ahead and revise my salary. As a CFO, focused as I was to keep company expenses under check, I went on to revise my salary to 75 lakh rupees, still short of the original salary of 80 lakh rupees at Amex. My ESOPs were still not revised, as Albi didn't feel it was the right time to approach investors with this proposal. In hindsight, it was my naivety that prompted me to take things at face value. While my financial growth was stunted, in terms of business we had progressed from 30 orders a day to 30,000 orders a day and had a footprint in 30 cities. From a small warehouse, where we had begun our journey, we had now moved to a 50,000 square foot office, one that I had helped put together. In fact, in my bid to get speedy work done at low cost, I had involved Maduri in the project, who was now diversifying from her furnishings business and taking up turnkey projects. This project, of course, was done by her on a no-profit no-loss basis. We turned around the office from scratch in 3 months and in under 1.5 crore, at less than 300 rupees per square foot. In fact, Kalyan Krishnamurti of Tiger Global, who was one of our investors, happened to visit our new office at the time. They had recently done up a 30,000 square foot office for Tiger Global in Bangalore, which had a cricket pitch with retractable nets. How much did doing up this office cost you? He asked me out of curiosity, given his own newly done up office. On hearing that it had cost 1.5 crore, he further inquired if I was telling him the entire amount or just the GST figure. Turns out that Tiger had spent 12 crore doing up their office, and the amount that we had spent would perhaps not even add up to the GST figure that they had paid. That it spoke strongly of our cost control mechanisms was clear for all. Maduri, of course, went on to take up other projects after this, an interesting one being doing up a farmhouse for Rahul Sharma of Micromax. That project had come about so well, as she told me, that I couldn't stop myself from going and seeing it. Posing as Maduri's man Friday who had come to drop off her stuff, I was literally blown away on seeing the place, which even had a golf course inside. This was later to become the Bollywood actress Asin's home. But I digress. As far as the Grofer's business model went, along the way we pivoted from the marketplace model, where we didn't stock any inventory, to having our own dark stores. The big disadvantage with the marketplace model was that the inventory of the shopkeepers wasn't live. Every so often, having received an order, when our field agent went to pick up the order from the shop, he would receive only part products. This not only caused huge operational issues, it also led to major discord with the customers. The regulations, 
however, didn't allow a foreign-owned entity to carry out retail business in India, and the e-commerce regulations were yet to see the light of day. I, therefore, worked at putting together an FDI-compliant structure that would enable us to own inventory and conduct business. For this, I created another subsidiary of the Singapore holding company called Hands on Trade, HOT. I also put together a few Indian-owned intermediate companies, so that when an order was placed on Grofers India, HOT, the wholesale entity, would sell to the intermediate entity, and, in turn, the intermediate entity would issue the invoice to the customer. Not only did I create this structure, it also became a template for other e-commerce players like Amazon. Later, when the government allowed 100% foreign-owned companies to carry out food retail through a license, I also ensured that Grofers became the first foreign entity to be issued this license. The proposed Grofers Big Basket merger. By mid-2016, the Grofers business had started stagnating. While we did business of $3 to $4 million every month, the burn was as much as $4 to $5 million a month. The year 2016 was also when Flipkart was going through a tough time with the snap deal Flipkart deal going on and off, and the overall funding scenario was becoming tighter. By January 2017, SoftBank, which had burned its hands in Snapdeal, started to get jittery. With Nikesh Arora, the president of SoftBank, moving on, Grofers was tagged as a Nikesh legacy company within the SoftBank ranks. I realized that SoftBank would not put any additional money into such a scenario. It was then that I suggested to Vikas Parekh, my counterpart at SoftBank, who worked, years later, closely with Masa San on WeWork, that we should attempt a Grofers Big Basket merger. The last funding round that Big Basket had raised was with the Qatar Investment Authority. Clearly, since they had gone up to the sovereign fund, there weren't many other avenues left for them to explore. As a combined entity, however, I felt that we could easily command a billion dollar valuation. I worked on the project in detail from March through July 2017, including on the likely valuation ratios for both the companies. There were, however, other external factors at play that would soon come in the way. Alibaba-backed Pay had set up the Pay Mall in February 2017, a B2C model inspired by China's Tmall, and it ended up burning a lot of money in the process. They were under tremendous pressure and were looking at strengthening their play in the e-commerce space. To them, Big Basket seemed an investment that could help them strengthen their online to offline strategy. The PayMall Big Basket deal eventually went through, with PayMall picking up a 40% stake in Big Basket. All thanks to Mater Diora, who had by then joined Pay as its CFO and knew Big Basket well, as Citi was their investment banker. Once that avenue was shut, I knew we didn't have a fighting chance. More than anything else, as a CFO, the pain of losing money on every single order was hard for me to disregard. While our average order size was between 1,000 rupees to 1,200 rupees, our earnings net of discounts on such orders was 120 rupees, whereas last mile delivery itself cost us 150 rupees. I was closer than anyone else to the real situation and knew that the Grofer's growth story wasn't sustainable. Parting ways. Once growth stagnated, there were frequent tiffs between Albi and Saurabh. One reason for this was the fact that the people Saurabh had appointed, largely from his alma mater, proved to be quite subpar. I'll be new of it. I had myself had a run-in with these guys on several occasions, and I strongly felt that the company hadn't invested in quality manpower. Each time, however, I would make a point with Sorb's recruits, he looked at it as an invasion of his authority, till one day he put his foot down with Albi and said that I should be asked to go. I couldn't make peace with the fact that the backbreaking work I had put in was being devalued to this extent. More than the money, I couldn't reconcile with the fact that I had been taken completely for a ride. I now saw my wife's prophecy, that I was being too trusting for my own well-being, coming true. Pushed to a corner, Grofers did offer the settlement amount of 1 crore, and I came out of the Grofers stint totally broken and was left questioning my own instincts. Little did I know at the time that I was to go down in history as perhaps the lone startup founder who would be shortchanged twice. Interestingly, it was at Grofers, in a conversation with Kotak CEO Deepak Gupta at our Sector 32, Gurgaon, office, that I had first mentioned the need for a single QR for shopkeepers. Little did I know that after one stint I would land up building a large business around the concept. This is the end of Chapter 5. Chapter 6 will be continued in next video. Till now. Thanks for watching.